I think we are live. Uh, so, welcome everybody. Uh, if we can just um, uh, give a few seconds so that hopefully uh, we get joined by um, the rest of our uh, panelists. I would like to welcome the attendees we have and of course the panelists. I'll take a few more minutes if, if we can, if you agree with me, so we can hopefully be joined. Ah, Voila. yes, we hey, managed. Hey. Hi, Luca. Oh, my God. I tried it six times uh, on, uh, on this. I think it was the system. I tried with the tablet, but on the tablet, uh, I do not have Chrome. I tried the other PC. It was running out. And I think that the term has the same problem. So. Okay. He, he, he mailed me that uh, he probably cannot make it because without Chrome browser, he cannot join us. So welcome, everybody. I think that uh, in, in that uh, uh, we, we, we should start. Uh, we're waiting for uh, uh, Mats Hellstrom to join us, hopefully. It's a pity not to have also a letter. So. Yes. We had so many experiences, uh, head of government, uh, head of uh, number two in the OCDA and after other roles. So. Why, why don't we just start and hope that he, Bats can join us, Alex? Yes, okay. I will, I, 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 let me start then and hopefully we'll get joined uh, by at least uh, Mats Hellstrom. So welcome uh, today. Thank you very, very much for being here. I'm honored to be moderating this uh, panel. Um, the topic of the panel, as you know, is Europe, its discords and harmonies. Uh, the European nations exhibit the wish to maintain their national characteristics, north and south, east and west, uh, though their political attitudes are constantly changing. Are our differences too great to halt the formation of a federal state? And is federalism necessary or could the, the present blue cycle survive? So this is the topic and joining us today, uh, we have a panel of uh, esteemed speakers. I have respectfully taken the liberty to shorten a bit the, the impressive uh, CVs. Um, uh, uh, so I will um, waste no more further time than to welcome you. Um, with us, we have Dr. Robert Herman. Uh, welcome. Dr. Robert Herman is the CEO of Germany Trade and Invest since February 2018, having previously directed the marketing and communications department and uh, also overseen the investors consulting department uh, since 2009. Dr. Herman holds the academic distinction of Doctor of Engineering from the Rhineland-Westfalen Technical University of Aachen. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, with us uh, also, we have Paul Hodges. Paul Hodges is a trusted advisor to major companies uh, and investment community. He has a proven track record of identifying key trends in global marketplaces. And he's a global expert with the World Economic Forum, as well as the chairman of New Normal Consulting. Welcome, Paul. Thank you very much. And with us, last but not least, we have uh, Luca Rayer. Uh, Am I saying it? Am I pronouncing it correct? Because I've heard no, so many different No, 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 no. <laughs> you, you are quite worse as a Scottish minister this morning. So, I I understand. <laughs> so I stand corrected. Please tell me because I... You, you should think French when you pronounce my name. Jaye is... Uh, Jaye. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, no look at Jaye. Perfect. So, Lucas Zayer is the European Semester Group Vice President dealing with the assessment of national recovery and resilience plans related to recovery and resilience facility of the European Union. He's a member of the European Economic and Social Committee since 2002 and its president from, 20, president from 2018 to 2020. He's an economist, an expert in third sector and social economy uh, in international cooperation, Africa and SDGs. Uh, so thank you all for joining us uh, today. Um, I hope that uh, two more of the panelists will be able to join us. Uh, just to mention them, we're waiting for uh, Mats Hellstrom, 
the former Minister of Foreign Trade, Nordic and EU Affairs, as well as Minister of Agriculture in the Swedish uh, government. And we're also um, wanting to connect with uh, Prime Minister Yves Le Terme, the former PM of uh, Belgium, Minister President of Flanders, former Minister of Foreign Affairs as well. Um, so um, let's, let's start uh, our uh, very challenging discussion. Um, Europe has been undoubtedly uh, for uh, the last centuries the most important social project of these centuries. Uh, I would, I would uh, say, if I'm allowed, it's an evolving effort to build a functional and sustainable uh, system of millions facing common challenges uh, and a vision. Europe is redefining, I would say, uh, what broadly used terms uh, we have up to now. Uh, union, confederation, federation, integration, national, supranational, intergovernmental. We move forward redefining them all and finding unity in our diversity, if I can say that. As always, it's not a linear path. Uh, whether facing our own problems or facing the global pandemic, we move forward reinventing what previously has failed us. And I, I, I'm, I'll allow me to say we do that successfully most of the times. Can we enrich what unites us and resolve what separates us? Where do you believe we, we stand today uh, in, in that sense? Um, would you like to start, uh, Robert, if, 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 you, if you want? Oh, a broad question to someone who is representing Germany, you see. Um, <laughs> so by the, nature of, by the nature of my business, um, you, you I, I have, have experience in federal here. Um, or by the nature of my responsibility. Um, but um, yes, yeah, thank you very much, um, Alex, for the opportunity to be here and to, to speak um, together with the distinguished um, other guests um, about a very difficult topic, um, the future of Europe. Um, I'm just coming out of an event here in Germany uh, where the German ambassadors meet once a year and speak about challenges, global challenges that we face. Um, and um, one of the major topics that, had, that we had um, over lunch, or they had digitally, same as here, uh, over lunch was the role of Europe um, in a globally um, uh, challenging um, economic situation and i know we don't we on, we do not only speak a bit about economic challenges we also speak about other challenges um alex have mentioned a few of them um uh, 27 members with 27 let's say social systems health systems tax systems um and so many other topics that i could mention um and then we have every other year um, new political leaders um um giving a framework, a new framework or a new attitude to the same framework um, makes it not easy. Um, even though I'm um, speaking about Germany um, uh, as, my, uh, uh, as my profession, um, I always start with Europe because it's about Europe to be um, to where we are. The market in, in, in Europe is, resp is relevant. Um, and I think um, uh, speaking about international trade and investments, um, uh, I think we um, I learn it from everyday work with companies who need to have a, a stronger position as Europe um, uh, than, than we have today. We need it in an economical, unstable situation. Unstable meaning that we have new poles, um, uh, we have new actors or other actors um, developing their perspectives on Europe or on, on the global framework. Um, and I think um, the sovereignty of Europe is relevant uh, not a single state is going to be able to play that role that we need to play as Europe in a competing situation where we have United States, where we have China, where we have even Russia and India as huge um, relevant nations. Um, uh, we need um, uh, uh, sovereign Europe playing a relevant role in this, I wouldn't say game, but situation um, where we have competing situations about the systems, and we see that from the pandemic, um, where we have different approach to different topics. We see that from economical um, perspectives on the mentioned systems um, uh, of international trade and investments and investment flows. Um, I have um, a clear understanding that we need the Europe, even though it's so difficult to um, uh, bring everyone's expectations together. And I don't see um, a quick and short path to the 
future. I see a long path to the future. Um, but I, um, what, what I have, and I hope um, uh, everyone has that a little bit at least, um, I have the passion to be part of Europe and to strengthen Europe as a um, region, as a legal framework, as a legal structure, even as a social structure, where we um, consider ourselves as Europeans and not only as Germans, French, Irish, and Spanish. So where we see ourselves as uh, Europeans. Um, uh, and um, I, I think we need that, absolutely. Um, uh, we're not there, there yet. We have a long way to go. Um, uh, probably, Alex and the um, talks that we had before the, the meeting, we talked about 50 years, maybe even more. Um, but we have to work on that. Um, uh, so um, uh, I think this is um, a major, uh, of major relevance for um, living in Europe, um, living um, uh, private life, not only business, not only um, social situations. It's a private life that everyone has um, that is shaped through the form that we do, that we give to Europe. And um, a last topic, a last idea that I have is, and we need to develop an emotion to Europe. That's my understanding. Emotionalize Europe a little more positively um, that we, everyone um, considers Europe as something that is, um, uh, a has positive connotations where we see positive opportunities, um, strengths. Yes, of course, also threats, but uh, the opportunities. This this is of interest, and I'd like to emotionalize Europe um, even more for my for my kids. Um, I know that my kids don't differentiate between north, east, south, west, skin color, um, uh, um, and whatever it is. Um, they are old enough to have an opinion, um, and they do not see that anymore. And I hope that we older ones um, see more and more the same, because we are shaping the future. The kids are not yet there, but um, we do ha have to do that for them and start for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I like the idea of emotionalizing Europe in order to build, I guess, a, a better common understanding, a better common vision. That's how you mean it, I guess. Uh, right. And uh, I hope that we're moving to the right uh, direction. Uh, Paul, would you please uh, share with us what's your view on the current um, path we're following? Certainly, yes. Delighted. I'm glad to see my old friend John Leggett, who I used to know from BP days, uh, in in the room. Uh, hello, John. Uh, yeah, I, I'm actually very positive, and I think uh, I, I think we're moving in the right direction. I'm actually in, in Portugal, and uh, yeah, I'm not Portuguese, obviously, a Portuguese resident. And I have to say, I'm incredibly impressed with what uh, Prime Minister Costa has achieved in his six months as as president. Uh, you know, he, he inherited a situation where one would have thought, uh, you know, with Germany first, that you know, things would be, you know, would, would have been nicely uh, worked through. Uh, but in fact, he's, you know, he, they, they had a very difficult time. They passed on a series of, of difficulties, uh, the vaccination crisis, the Brexit crisis, uh, all of these things. And uh, when you look, uh, you know, in partnership with, with the Commission and the, and the, other, the other 26, uh, the thing that makes me really positive now is the recovery fund and the fact that that has gone through and also uh, that Costa chose for his summit uh, in Porto a couple of weeks ago to focus on the social aspects, which I think Robert, is, is exactly what you're talking about. You know, to me, probably the most important thing that, that Europe will do for its citizens today that they recognise is the vaccination passport. That's the level at which people affect. You know, when we went through the, uh, the Brexit campaign and so, and so on, um, you know, people talked about the four freedoms. I mean, for goodness sake, what is a f four freedoms? It doesn't, it, you know, it does not work in the pub. It does not work in, the, you know, in, in, in anything, really. You've, you've, got to, uh, you've got to bring it home. And, and so here we are. Yeah, the, 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 we, we leave aside the, the fuss about the vaccines at the start. I'm sure that, you know, that's been resolved. We've now got this fact, very impressive vaccination rollout, and we're going to have, hopefully, 27 countries where everyone travelled again, and everyone who wants to have a VR stamp can go and, and do it. 
Now, that is an amazing achievement. And I think that what we need to be doing, as you say, Robert, is to concretize these things. We, we've, we've got to work on those things which affect ordinary people. And that, to me, the, the Green Revolution is a wonderful opportunity to do that. Because what we're talking about is taking back control, which was a very effective slogan for, uh, for Brexit, after all. So global supply chains are coming to an end. That's very clear. Uh, you know, I helped to set them up when I was an ICI. You know, I, was, I did an awful lot out in Asia and, and places like that and in the States. But they, they haven't worked. They're fragile. They're still not working. So we've got to bring back. If we look at energy, we can see that energy is now moving to renewable energy. Martin Brudermüller from, uh, from BASF uh, yesterday uh, saying, you know, we, you know, Germany, for goodness sake, get rid of all these restrictions. Let us put in renewable energy. Let's stop the bureaucracy and get on with it. Uh, uh, you know, and, uh, Martin is absolutely right on that. And so let's break down some of this paperwork, let's break down some of these barriers, because we are going to have much more of a Europe of the cities. And I, I think that the biggest thing that Europe could now do, and I, you know, I, I, you know, I listen to Franz Tillemans and I listen to my, my friends in the Commission, and I think I'm sure they're working on this, is the, 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 the opportunity from the 15 minute city. So that we can actually now go back to the idea of a city where you can reach, you're within a village, within your city. And within a 15 minute walk or a 15 minute bike ride, you can get to health, you can get to school, you can get to shops, you may even get to your offices. And of course, yes, you can go out, but you're basically going to be in a car free area. So it's safe for people, the, 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 the air quality is good and so on. And so you reinvented local living. And I think that is a fun that, you know, over the next five to 10 years, that is going to be a really powerful way of contextualizing the green recovery, because that means something. If I can and that, because you know, we go back a year ago, what was the one thing that really positive came out of the, uh, of the first lockdowns? It was being able to walk outside, and see the sky and breathe the air. That's what people said. I remember the, the Deputy Mayor of Milan saying, we're now able to do things today that we thought were going to be in 2030. So um, so these are the key elements, I think, that uh, that are important. And I think, you know, we've got 1.7 trillion euros. So, you know, <laughs> we can do it. Your mic is muted. Uh... No. Thanks. We can't hear you. No. Your micro is muted. I think you were referring yeah. to everybody else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> apologies. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Paul. You've touched so many different uh, points. Uh, uh, but I guess you talked uh, mostly about uh, social cohesion and you talked about the recovery plans. So I guess that's the best pass that uh, uh, Luca could get uh, uh, on his uh, field, uh, if, if, if I'm allowed to say that. So will you please share with us um, your view on uh, how we're doing towards uh, a, a more united Europe, whether we call it federal or not? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much um, for this opportunity. And uh, I, I would share completely the opinion of Paul about uh, the enormous achievement of the Prime Minister Costa. When I met him uh, two years ago, he was preparing, uh, of course, we were in the pre-pandemic era, but he has uh, exactly got the result that he wanted to, to, to get. Uh, and the, the, the mm. list on uh, the Porto Declaration about the social pillar is not... Uh, is not a, a parenthesis. Uh, someone has read the, not not the declaration of the commitment, but all the action plan that has been prepared unanimously by 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 the, by the commission with the full support of the parliament. Uh, we can see there something that they make. And uh, and again, I think and this is very close to my heart. I agree with Robert. Me, Europe needs emotion. Europe needs a new narrative. For two long times, for two long times, I have to say, since we achieved the double 
major result of the beginning of the century, the euro and the enlargement, we have trans transformed at large the discourse on Europe on simply fact, figures and rationality. The space of humans in relation between them, the space for which we make uh, our city, our public space living, and the space of politics is emotion. We had to pass through the terrific sovereignist dangers in Europe that has been realized also in some parts, look to the UK and to the Brexit uh, winning campaign or to the United States with Trump, to understand that emotion still in the time after the end of ideology can be the mover and the shaker of the public space against any fact, figures and rational thinking, against anything of this. We had to pass through this. So I was not so much emotional though as Italian, we, we have a long tradition of being federalist, uh, uh, Altiero Spinelli and so on, and uh, you, you will not find any politician that doesn't declare himself as a federalist, except Mario Draghi, never declared about this. And I am a little bit closer to him from this point of view, but uh, so I am not passionate about this. First, because I think that in the world you have many models of federalism. Just to mention a few, uh, you have uh, the, the Brazilian one, the Indian one, the United States one, the German one is a federalist state, the Swiss one, and no one is equal to the other. You have also the Soviet Union federalist system, it was another one. Huh? So I think if, uh, I understand the push, but I think that Europe has done step by step with some important stop before restarting the goal, a, a big walk uh, making concrete the three original mandates of Europe that are so clear stated in the, in the Schuman Declaration. From a humble point of view, the best political manifesto ever with the Declaration of Independence of the United States. Huh? And the three principles that are fixed there and that we have seen again at work and produce effect now during the pandemic, the decision taken are the compulsory solidarity. Schumann was speaking about uh, solidarity de facto. Huh? The shared responsibility and open to the world. The Schumann Manifesto was saying, making the sharing of, uh, of steel and carbon, we have to share with Africa, that is the political and historical mission of Europe with others. So, as all the old achievements of Euro, the no one at internal market, the Eurozone, the trade agreement where Europe has seeded at large, the, all the legal international system of trade has been seeded by European values and European standards. But to be very honest, these are shaping the world. Now we have seen during this pandemic unprecedented decision, unprecedented rupture of taboo, and even accelerating the, the transformation that Paul was declining as the future. Because this new legislative period and the von der Leyen Commission has started after the big success of the European elections that stopped the sovereignist with the Green Deal. But after the pandemic, we have doubled the speedness of this transition. The standard of 60% announced and after 55% of reduction of CO2 in 10 years has been decided this autumn in one month. And it is the double of the standard that was setting one year before, before the pandemic. So we have done something unprecedented. We have suspended the stability in Rome Pact. We have suspended all the state aid regulation. Yes, some in Italy are very critical with this. Because they are saying, ah, you see, half of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, the state aid regulation suspension and be benefited to Germany. Germany got uh, 1.2 trillion uh, euro of authorization on the 2.4 signed by Vestal. I say, hello, finally. It was since 20 years that we are speaking how to oblige Germany to spend her enormous budget surplus. And so now they have spent. 
as Italy is exporting 40% of its uh, manufacturing to Germany, this is good news also for Italy, if the Germans is spending its surplus. But that was not done. That was, we cannot discuss about this before. And, and now we have done what was the, uh, the taboo in Europe, the Eurobonds. We have already done with Sure in one month, 100 uh, uh, million euro collected to the market, and now we are going with the ratification of the own resources uh, decision of the Council by all the member states, all, even the sovereignist one, or even the Nordic one, as a lot of all have ratified, the, the Union will go to the market to borrow money and to invest uh, for this transition. Uh, in So, and for, you were mentioning also the, the large success and the deal success, although at the beginning we had some problems of the vaccination campaign. First, one year ago, we didn't have any vaccine. Uh, June 2020, vaccine was uh, uh, a dream. Uh, now, not only we have, but we are at a speed of vaccination that is even passing over the United States. The last figure per million, we are going over the United States, having shared half of our production with the rest of the world, not having closed our borders. So again, compulsory solidarity, share, compul shared responsibility and open and sharing with the world. That's what will work. Of course, not everything is uh, already done because we have in front of us two major challenges. Huh? One was already mentioned by Robert. We, after having stepping down for 20 years around the, the problem of adaptation in general with the big enlargement, now we are discovering that the other parts of the world are running very fast and we are surrounded by wars and insecurity around Europe. China is buying our state, our economy, our road, our technology. We are depending on them, on the raw materials, and we are so we are waking up. Eh? So now we speak about industrial strategy for Europe. But I remember that uh, it was no more than seven years ago when uh, Tajani was the commissioner for industry. And you know that Tajani is a very moderate conservative. And as he was speaking about the necessity to have an industrial strategy here in the Brussels bubble, he was denominated the last communist in Europe. And you can imagine Tajani being nominated communist because he was thinking about the need to have an industrial strategy. Today, industrial strategy is at the core. The digital strategy, the green transformation, uh, sustainable and energy transformation of Europe in a very, very... So where, where we are going for this, uh, but this moving is unprecedented and is done with the core consensus of everybody. Of course, uh, we have the foreign policy and security we are still blocked. It's not possible that the veto one country, last Hungary, Hong Kong, uh, didn't allow European Union to take a position before it was about Russia, or was about Cyprus, or was about uh, Erdogan and Turkey, and security is the same. And we have uh, the next step, will be the reform of the stability pact the completing of the EMU and the banking union. And I hope that finally we will reform the stability pact toward a sustainable pact that will include all the components of the strategies we have already designed. And we have, unfortunately, two still major elements of discord, deep discord and deep division in Europe. One is a question where in, uh, in the last uh, seven years we have not moved one centimeter. That is the migration and asylum issue. Nothing has moved in the council. If you close your eyes and you listen to the voice of the ambassador, you can detect that this country, this country, although the ambassador did. Nothing has moved on this issue from seven years. And the second one has been. Luca, uh, Luca, uh, I see Max has joined us. It would be great yeah. if we could. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry to cut in, but I think, you know, the great thing. Uh, is what we have not uh, expected is the rule of Do you hear me? Law. Yeah, yeah, great to hear you guys. Great. You hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I try, to get, I try to get in all the time. I heard you. But my just a uh, Matt, just a second so that Luca can finish his sentence, if that's okay. Yeah. Sorry? Just what? a second. G give us just a second so that yes, Luca yes. can finish his uh, sentence. 
Of course. And so it is the rule of law and the utilitaristic interpretation of the fundamental values and freedom and a constituency of the European Union that is the Article 2 of the Treaty. This has been completely unexpected because we know that uh, during the, the pre and last year, the Copenhagen criteria were at the core. So we were expecting that this was fixed forever. And we discovered that we have a discord on the separation of power, on the fundamental liberties, uh, and on fundamental values. So, elements of discord remain, but I think that we have such a moving of transformative moving, positive moving that are declining in a new powerful way. These three historical elements I was saying, compulsory solidarity, self responsibility, and open to the world, that this should become the new narrative, the new emotion that we have to communicate in what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. Much welcome. Uh, Thank you. I'm very happy you, you are able to join us. Uh, I don't know if you had the chance to listen to us. I have, li I have listened to you, but I couldn't come in. Perfect. Let me please anyway. introduce, because I, I, I was hoping that you will join. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us Mats Hellstrom. He's the Foreign Minister of Foreign Trade, Nordic and EU Affairs, as well as the Minister of Agriculture of the Swedish Government, former Ambassador of Sweden to Germany and the Governor of the Province of Stockholm. Welcome, and thank, thank you very you. much for joining us. Thank you. Well, over 70 years, the European Union has survived many crises and self-inflicted wounds to become, I think, a resilient organization. This, the Financial Times concludes in a recent analysis. The unions which are in deep trouble now are the US and the UK. Europe's right-wing nationalists have changed their tone. Salvini and Le Pen are no longer advocating exit. The COVID has told us clearly the need for cross-border and global cooperation after initial drawbacks with Alain Gang and the fear of the other. The EU system has shown new resolve. The multi-billion euro COVID recovery fund is not, not previously expected grand initiative to help out weaker states. Orban is cynical, but not stupid. He will not stalk out of EU. By and large, young people are more pro-EU than old aged. EU is a careful and evolving hybrid balance between national and supranational power, between technocracy and democracy. That is a source of stability and strength, not a weakness or frailty. I share this view of the Financial Times, and I would like to add that the many subgroupings in the EU, Northern, Eastern, or Mediterranean, which are sometimes seen as divisive, can in fact be a strength for the Union. When you engage and take care of your close neighbors, it can increase the coherence and insights of this vast Union stretching from the Azores to Beauvesia. And certainly, the recent tumult in world politics has laid bare the need for new tasks and challenges. We have this new <coughs> European Future Conference coming up. The welfare states should be built on stronger local participation, not least in the light of populist onslaughts of liberal democracy. More attention should be taken to the urban countryside inequalities, and gender equality should be a goal to mainstream. And after COVID, it is important, very important, to get back to free mobility in Europe. Especially young people should be able to move freely to study, work, and research in the whole of the European Union. These are all issues to be dealt with in the newly started European Future Conference. And there are clouds of the horizon to be dealt with. Respect for the democratic value system must be upheld. Are there safe, safety guards built in the next generation Europe enough with possible reprisals against undemocratic behavior in member states? And is Europe really ready to handle and to diminish effects of possible outbreaks of future pandemics? and how to prepare for other black swans. So far, the European Union has managed to maneuver forward between Skula and Charybdis in dangerous waters due to the flexibility of the Union, the flexibility really. We have to see it so that this capacity will be developed, developed also closely more in a connected global future. There's much talk nowadays on strategic autonomy. This somewhat strange concept in a globally dependent world can make sense in a context 
where there's an emerging high-tech Cold War between the United States and China. Europe should not just relate defensively on where to position itself. The EU should in high-tech trade and in other fields like saving a livable climate act decisively in the multilateral field to set standards, standards for the new products and new systems with the purpose of making them globally acceptable. This is even more important with the new types of service companies emerging during the pandemic lockdowns. The EU is large enough as an actor to act on such a standard-setting role. And finally, Europe was a Phoenician princess being forcefully taken, as we know, by the god Zeus, disguised as a white bull to Crete, where she brought up the children she had with him. So much for the myth. In reality, Phoenicia developed much of Mediterranean Europe fairly closely knit together at least 2,000 years through trade centers and culture. That kind of networking society also plays a role today. Europe's strength does not lie in being a continental empire, but of many cultures cross-fertilizing each other. Thank you very much for taking, having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you all for touching so different, I think, aspects, but uh, uh, w although with different viewpoints, we're all, I think, saying the same things and uh, mostly uh, agree, which is good. And I, I believe that um, we are moving forward and uh, there, there are um, next steps to take. So uh, if I can please return to Robert. Um, Robert, you talked about um, uh, emotionalizing Europe. Uh, we talked about a lot of things from vaccine to obviously uh, the recovery funds and financial strategy and a lot of uh, the principles that uh, so, so uh, well uh, Luca said. How do you believe we should proceed in order to achieve these targets in the future? Um, thank you. Um, uh, thank you also for the others uh, for your all your um, statements. I think um, there has been so much um, relevant in that, um, and so many relevant and very very important topics. Um, uh, the question is, um, uh, how can I in uh, in just sixty seconds reduce what is necessary for the future um, and next step? Um, uh, if I see how um, the wrong political parties uh, get out their voice, uh, it's even if I don't like it, it's simplicity. Um, uh, and uh, maybe we should do that um, in our perspective or the same way on a positive way, simplicity. Because I think um, what I learned from my kids from school, from the other generations, but, but also from the people on the streets, um, uh, no one understands politics anymore. So it's so difficult to understand what it means voting or what it means uh, to be a member of Europe and to understand Europe. And um, I think simplicity would be um, one topic that we should have in mind if we speak about Europe and the benefit of Europe and what it means to be a European. And um, um, Matthias, you mentioned um, the idea of um, the different cultures and that we need the different cultures to, um, yeah, to uh, strengthen our, anti or our, our, our yeah, let's say, soul of Europe. Um, but we have to make it understandable that Europe doesn't mean that something disappears. It means uh, diversity, but it means also um, uh, a together, um, uh, understanding together. But again, it means also um, we have to make it understandable. I think most of the people have the difficulty to understand what it means. Um, uh, if we have a European Union, what is their right, their role, how is the government or the structure, what is the function of this and this, that entity? Um, so we have to uh, go away where it's um, uh, understandable, um, because it's understandable. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> Um, we have to explain it better. You're, you're muted again, Alex. I'm sorry. Uh, just, just one quick question. 
Do you believe all these things that were mentioned now, whether that's the vaccination passport, that uh, I'm proud that it's uh, our Prime Minister's uh, uh, proposal, or whether that's the recovery fund, or the Green Deal, or all the other things that we mentioned, do do the people not see this as a progress? Do you, Do they understand this huge progress during the last difficult years of the pandemic? Do they understand and, and, and connect to that? I think the topics that you mentioned are um, understandable, um, but the legislation that comes out of Brussels um, gives the impression of difficulty and complexity. Um, and um, the translation into the federal regions um, is even more complex because everyone is um, translating that into regional differences. Um, so um, that's the, um, the, the topic. Um, and um, we have more and more topics um, that we have to deal with. Um, all of a sudden we have what, what is data protection. Um, we never thought about data protection. All of a sudden we have something that we have to understand and no one else. Um, and then there is also a European, a German and a whatever solution. So um, uh, there are some, that's the topic. Also, um, let's say politics are anyway being more and more complex. And then if you have your national politics um, and then a European perspective, makes it even more complex. So that's the difficulty. Simplicity. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul, um, I have to ask you, because your analysis of the key role of demographics in driving key uh, global economy has attracted interest. Um, given the demographics is a bit in the news lately uh, concerning China, which, you know, we, uh, it was mentioned, China and, and U.S. and all the new polls and, and, and the new, you know, uh, power redistribution. Um, do you th also think it should be a, a discussion about the Europe's common position? Absolutely, because at the end of the day, uh, demographics is the unseen driver of, of what we're doing. You know, if you look back... Uh, in, uh, in 1950, the world population was two and a half billion people. You get to uh, today, it's 7.8 billion people. Well, you don't need central banks to give you growth. If you're going from two and a half billion to 7.8, you're going to get growth. But the great thing is, and you know, we're just a couple of weeks away from the 225th anniversary of uh, Dr. Robert Jenner and his invention of, uh, of smallpox vaccination. After which, you know, life expectancy has doubled since uh, uh, since 1796, and um, e um, economic output, GDP per capita, has gone up more than tenfold. So, but we now have this generation. You know, some of us on this call are part of this perennials 55 generation. So, you know, when I joined ICI all those years ago, uh, you know, we were told, look, you know, the great thing about ICI is that you you join. And, you know, it, you, you, you retire at 62 and you get your gold watch and then you die at 65, normal pension age, but you have three years on the golf course or whatever it is you want to do. But of course, you know, we're not dying 65. This generation is a set, is, is, is a, a, a life for the first time, but we are a replacement economy. So we're not going to be buying lots of new things and we do need sustainability because most of us are moving on to pensions and so on, and we leaving the workforce. So we need to do more with less. And of course, millennials, you know, they're not excited by the idea of, uh, of getting fitted carpets or color televisions or central heating or in the way that the boomers were. They're, they're looking for experiences. So the younger people and older people are all going in the same direction. And that I believe is an absolutely crucial driver for sustainability. And exactly as, um, we, we, George, George and Luca have been, been saying you know, that, that the need is to make this tangible to people in very simple terms. People, you know, if, you know, I, I work for a large company. And one of the things we were taught was if you want to say something, keep it simple. You know, Bill Clinton's KISS principle, keep it simple. Stupid.